All right, we are live, so we can start. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, welcome, and um, I hope uh, we're going to have a very nice uh, and cozy discussion tonight. Um, I would like to welcome you to the fourth panel in the series for Revealing, Recording, Reflecting Women Graphic Designers from Southwest Asia and North Africa. The project, um, Revealing, Recording, Reflecting, is um, a speculative research on generation and women graphic designers from Southwest Asia and North Africa and the diaspora. The project uses the exhibition platform as an editorial space to collect, reveal, retell, and record the work and untold stories of the women graphic designers, calligraphers, typographers, and illustrators who play key roles in shaping and rethinking visual and material culture of the region. Um, this project has been initiated um, uh, in March, actually, well, a little bit before, but we started the project in March. And it is organized in such a way that we have four main researchers that are kind of leading specific questions on, on design from the region. Um, there we are holding these questions within these panels. So, um, and we have at the same time an exhibition space in, in Berlin at A to Z Presents, where we are collecting the material. And so it's a, an editorial space where people can come and interact with the material, add to it. And the exhibition is an ongoing growing exhibition until another month, I think. Um, and then we, we collect this material and make a publication from it. Um, we are four researchers, myself, uh, Yasmin Nashabe uh, Taran, who held the second panel. The first panel was an introduction with the four of us. The second panel was Yasmin's. Uh, the third panel was held by uh, Dr. Bahia Shab. And this panel will be with Sukaina Hashem. And Sukaina is here to present herself and present her panels and present her guests. So I hope you have a wonderful time and I'm looking forward to listening to you um, and would like to welcome you all as guests, as our guests. And, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to interacting and listening to your presentations. So I will switch myself off and I give the floor to Sukaina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Huda, for the introduction. Thank you everyone for, for being here and thank you Zina and Lina for being here as well. I'm gonna introduce myself briefly. Um, I'm a Moroccan designer. Um, I work uh, in Casablanca, Morocco. Uh, I run a company named Shape. Uh, it's a strategic consultant agency that merges design and strategy. Uh, we work a lot in spaces, but also in graphics. And I have initiated in Casa, uh, Casablanca Design Week in 2017, uh, that was held again in 2019, where we gathered more than 100 uh, designers in more than 25 spaces with a wonderful team and uh, for a wonderful experience. I'm going to stop here to uh, maybe introduce you to the panel. Um, um, image making behind the lines of engaged graphic designers. Um, the idea is to address social engagement of women with their context, but also to highlight the creative journey behind their work that is inspired from uh, their perspective, the, their social, political, uh, cultural perspectives. Um, we want to uh, uh, see together what is behind the final draft, uh, what is the journey of uh, creation, the personal journey, but also the journey with the community. Um, and for that, I have invited wonderful women that I'm humbled to present, uh, Lina Raybe, Sarah Rizqallah, and Dina Mohammed. Um, Lina, I'm going to introduce you briefly, but I think you're going to introduce uh, yourself uh, with a more relevant way. Uh, Dina is a comics and animation artist living in Beirut. Uh, she's also an associate professor in the American University of Beirut, founder, uh, director of the Mu'ataz and Rada Sawaf uh, Arabic Comics Initiative. Uh, your research focuses on comics. 
from the Arab world as part of the contemporary, co co contemporary Arab culture. Uh, with most recent article, how the internet revolutionized, revolutionized <laughs> <revolutionary> comic books, <laughs> graphic novels from the Arab world, etc. Um, you're here as uh, an academic, but also as a designer who has her journey, like maybe more than 20 years of, of work that is uh, that has a clear impact on yourself, but also on your entourage. Thank you, Lina, for being part of this uh, panel. Thank you for having me. Also, I want to introduce Sara uh, Rizqallah, who unfortunately can't uh, be here with us because of uh, health reasons. Sara, we think about you. Uh, we send you a lot of love and uh, uh, healing thoughts. Sara is a PhD student of sociology and uh, social anthropology. The, uh, uh, no, is a PhD student in the sociology and social anthropology department at the Central European University in Vienna. She is also one of the main researchers for the 25th Revolution Oral History Project at the American University Library in Egypt uh, and the Oral History Project of Heliopolis at the British, British University in Egypt in partnership with Leicester University. Her master thesis was entitled The Visualization and Representation of Gender in Egyptian Comics. And she has received multiple awards for her outstanding academic performance. Sarah is not a designer, but um, her expertise on sociology and social anthropology, and also her experience with um, comics and designers has given her a great insight about our subject in a way that um, maybe she's not here to share it, uh, but uh, for our publication, she will share a great deal about her perspective of the subject. And finally, Dina, um, Dina Mohammed, uh, who I am glad she accepted our invitation, is an illustrator and graphic designer who first started creating comics at the age of 18. Um, <laughs> her satirical webcomic about a visibly uh, Muslim superheroine Kahira addressed social issues and got imme immediate reaction, challenging subjects revolving around women empowerment and diversity is not an easy task, but she has managed to bravely take a stand, attacking, attracting, maybe attacking as well, <laughs> attracting attention from big media outlets. Um, Dina is uh, such an amazing soul. We had a beautiful interview together and she had really inspired me a lot with uh, the way she sees life, the way she sees her work and the way uh, she shares her work with her community. I think um, she has a great input on how this creative journey can impact oneself, but also the other. And she's gonna share it with us. Um, we're gonna- Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dina. Quickly, before giving you the, the mic or uh, uh, giving you the chance to share with, uh, with us your presentation, I'm gonna highlight quickly what it is about uh, this subject. Uh, as we said earlier, it's about revealing, it's about recording and unveiling uh, certain uh, subjects about uh, women graphic designers, engaged ones. Well, the idea is um, because we are um, uh, we are kind of um, receiving uh, images that are final, images that are the final work of a designer, especially women designers. We never go into what is going on before, into the draft, into the struggle. So the idea is to record what is lost in translation, what we don't see, what is behind this final line and all the moments of questioning that goes um, through this journey. Uh, I would love also to unfold the space of change that creation, that graphic design, that um, this uh, action of change making can create in a designer and can resonate with the community and how it does resonate. We we'll finally reveal this inner journey that we all have as humans, our life journey. 
or how it can um, impact a social change through evolving a consciousness from what is going on inside to what can go outside from a me to a we storytelling, and this through image making. Dina, if you want to take the hand and introduce your panel, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. And thank you for Lina and Hoda and Sofina for having me, uh, especially like uh, it's, it's a huge, huge honor actually for me to be amongst everyone. Uh, I Sofina has already kind of introduced what I do, which is I make uh, comics mainly, but I actually studied graphic design. So I'm not too out of place on this panel. I don't often work in graphic design, but I uh, do have a design background. And I found that this really helped me uh, when I started making comics because I realized that design thinking um, is actually a huge part of my process, not necessarily in creating visuals, but in how I solve problems. Uh, and to do that, let me, sort of explain my uh, journey to you guys. I called this panel on questioning because I felt like this was the most vague term I could use to talk about self-doubt because I wasn't sure what kind of self-doubt I would cover since there are so many types of self-doubt that the artists go through. Um, so I will try and go through uh, kind of my journey in comics. And through that, I think it becomes really clear what kind of challenges I was facing. Uh, because I think they were a little bit unique because my journey in comics was very strange, actually. <laughs> uh, so, so can we have the next uh, panel? Thank you. So I started making comics, uh, as previously explained with Kohoro, which was a webcomic that I started when I was 18. And essentially, um, we were talking about how you have a process of making a draft and then putting it out in the world. With this webcomic, none of that happened. It was a very uh, spontaneous process. I was reading an article. The article was really misogynistic and annoying. I decided to make a comic in response. I posted it on Tumblr. Uh, I had an immediate response. It was very conversational, which was something I really um, appreciated about webcomics at the time because I wasn't actually, I didn't think I was making comics. I thought I was just making like an image in response to an article, because as someone who's used to drawing as a form of self-expression, it just felt kind of like the natural thing to do. And I, I was, it was all very direct. So it was just social commentary. I wanted to talk about certain issues, like misogyny, like sexual harassment. And I was encouraged by the response I was getting because Kohera got very, very, um, very widespread, very fast because it was online. And for the first couple of comics, I didn't really think about it too deeply. I was just uh, kind of doing it on the spot because it was mainly motivated by annoyance and also kind of a desire to converse with people to, to kind of, uh, I, I was already posting it on Tumblr, which is kind of a more community-based platform. So it's not a gallery platform. It's not a platform where you would post something and go. It's a platform where you post something and you get like, thousands of responses from people who are very critically engaged, people who have a lot to say. I was only 18. I was talking about very big topics. I was learning a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot in that period of time. And then when I made this comic, uh, which was about sexual harassment, uh, people asked me to translate it into Arabic. And this was the translation. You can see that it's still left to right. I was originally making the comics in English because on Tumblr, I was posting in English. Their Arabic support was terrible, still is. Um, and so when I made it in Arabic, I didn't think anyone would want to read it. So I didn't take the translation too seriously. I just did it very roughly. Um, and then to my surprise, it was even more popular in Arabic. And it was even more popular in Egypt, which I didn't expect because I think um, Lohera was a webcomic that used kind of like superhero tropes to address things. So like, obviously, you know, the sexual harassers are the villains, but is the hero. It's an easy way to send messages. Um, but I thought that would be corny to Egyptians, so I didn't think they would like it. And I was very surprised that the response was very, very positive. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, so what happened is actually I was receiving a lot of validation for Kohera because it was going very viral and a lot of people had a lot to say about it. Uh, 
And actually, when you were introducing Soro just now, um, I realized Soro actually wrote the paper about gender in comics. And I think Kohera was in this paper. And I only discovered this this year. And the really funny thing is that I think Sora and I were at university at the same time. <laughs> and I like, and she was writing the paper about Kohera, which she never talked to me about it. <laughs> but that's fair because it was anonymous for like the first couple of years. But I think we were literally working on our thesis at the same time. <laughs> so that's that's interesting. Um, so that was kind of like the level of academic interest that Kohera had. Um, and at the time, this is one of the more recent comics I've made. But um, at the time, I remember that I was receiving a lot, again, a lot of external validation. But personally, I was starting to feel um, less confident because I was being exposed to so much. And I started to feel like I actually didn't know enough or I wasn't as confident in my work. I feel like this level of success was too early for me. And in a way, I was also uncomfortable with kind of being someone who talks about issues because I was first and foremost an artist. And although I was talking about issues, I wasn't sure I wanted to be talking about issues for the rest of my life. I wanted to be telling stories. Um, and I was also I was also starting to learn more about the things I was talking about. And because of that, it became more difficult to make like these kind of very popular sort of flash in the pan statements. It's really hard to, to be nuanced in 10 pages, which is the limit for a webcomic. Um, and I, essentially, I, I, I started to feel, I started to believe what people were saying less, as in people would be like, wow, this is amazing. This is so brave. This is so good. And I was not really, I, I wasn't really absorbing it the same way. I, I was saying, for me, I felt Kohera was fun because it was a way for all of us to talk about things. But then when I felt like I was getting crazed, for opinions that most people had, it started to feel not insincere, but I started to realize that this is kind of how social media functions, how the media functions in general, is that they tend to overpraise something. They tend to kind of put it up on a pedestal and like, so they can, you know, write like articles, like this Egyptian woman is fighting sexual harassment. And I was like, I'm actually like, I'm just making comics. It's, it's not that deep. Um, and so even though it was true to an extent, it wasn't the way I wanted to present myself. It wasn't, I wasn't feeling confident in it anymore. So I kind of, uh, what happened then is that I was very, very lucky is that uh, Bahia who, who runs the other panel, <laughs> she was actually my mentor at the time. And she kind of figured out what I was doing because I had been doing Kohara anonymously. And then at some point, I think I, I went up to her and I was like, oh, Bahia, by the way, I've been doing this like when I'm not in class and, and not working on graphic design. <laughs> And she immediately kind of understood, like at, up until that point, the head didn't understand what kind of person I was, which made sense because I was not a good student. Um, but once she saw that I was making comics on the side, she like understood me right away. She was like, oh, this is what you do. And here's what you need. And so she introduced me to comics artists in Egypt. She brought Shinnewi for a lecture. And she also introduced me to Lina. And she, she told me I should do my thesis on Egyptian comics. And up until then, I had been kind of working totally independently. I was making this comic anonymously. I, um, and it had been about two years and, and it had sort of gotten a lot of attention. And then I start, stopped making it because I was like all over the place. Um, and so when I started researching Egyptian comics uh, and I, I started to feel suddenly like all of the doubt I had started to vanish because I was thinking less about what I was doing and I was learning more which helped me feel like I wasn't just, because uh, when, when things go viral, it feels like a stroke of luck. Like it's not dependent on the quality of the thing you make. It's dependent on who saw it and when. The quality is there, but luck is also a big factor. And to me, I didn't want to be someone who was dependent on luck because that felt very scary. <laughs> and it felt like I would always be chasing this external validation. Like I would be chasing, oh, how many shares did this last comic get? How many, like, uh, what, what would happen if I talked about this? What would happen if I talk about this? I didn't wanna be living like that. It's not a good way to, to live artistically. It's, it's just very limiting to you. Um, can we have the next, next panel? So this was my 
process of studying for my thesis. I basically gathered as many comics as I could. I Part of this was also that I learned a lot from Lina at the time because Lina was one of the very few people who was doing like histories of Arab comics and that included Egyptian comics and just like going through archives of comics and starting to understand where I was situated in this history because a lot of like to me it was very strange that when people wrote about me they would be like as if I'm the only person making comics in the Middle East because I'm the only person they had heard about and I was like very shocked to, feel, you know, to see how they dismissed such a long history we have with the art form, with comics in general. So it was very grounding to look at other people's work and also very inspiring because I realized, ah, oh, this is what I want to be doing. I actually do love comics. I hadn't been aware that I loved comics because I was making them before I really understood them. So it was really good to be in the process of actually taking a step back and then learning from scratch. Um, so we go to the next slide. Um, and part of that was also thinking about Egyptian comics because with Kohiro, a lot of the attention was based on the subject matter because it was social commentary. So most people were interested in the social issues. And I admit as well the art because I made it so fast. It wasn't really representative of my art style. It wasn't representative of my comic skill because it was something that I was just making to talk about a certain topic. And so when I was researching Egyptian comics, one of the things I discovered was that, or not really discovered, one of the things I was able to finally vocalize is that there is actually a distinct look to Egyptian visual art, to Egyptian comics, sequential art especially. And this was through Mahidine Labed. I always find this image very like evocative because basically he redraws stereotypical, very popular American and British characters. And the way he draws them, you immediately know that an Egyptian has drawn them in Mahaldin Labed style. And it kind of helped me nail down what I was doing. And it kind of helped me understand more about what I wanted to be doing. Uh, and after that, I started working on Shubik Lubik, which was, next slide. Yes, so this is Shubik Lubik, which is my graphic novel trilogy that I recently completed. And so um, after Kohira, I knew that I wanted to be making comics and I knew I wanted to be storytelling and I knew I wanted it to be something for Egyptians, as opposed to like a web comic that was kind of in English, kind of in Arabic. And I was always thinking about it in English and in Arabic, which was not, um, which was frustrating actually, because you're always thinking about who's going to see it, who's going to read it, how are they going to interpret it? Some artists, they're able to just do what they want and they don't think about what other people read or what other people will interpret because it's not their responsibility. And I admire that, but I can't work that way. I'm always thinking about what people will interpret. How, how can I change this? How can I influence that? And that's part of, I think, starting with web comics, which are so conversational. So my audience was always a big part of how I worked. So with Shubik Big, I was thinking I wanted to be free of this. So I knew I wanted to make something that would just be printed and published in Arabic, and it would just be available in Egypt. And after that, whatever happens, happens. But I mainly wanted to just work on this one comics project. Um, so this is when I was originally starting Shubik Shubik. This one actually does have drafts because this was a very long-term project. It's not a webcomic and it was something I wanted to make to show, showcase the full extent of my style. I wanted to put all of the research I had done, all of the things I had learned into a proper comic and I wanted it to feel Egyptian. I wanted people to read it and and feel comfortable, especially in Egypt, because we still, even though we have a long history of comics, our contemporary comic scene is very underground. So I wanted something that would kind of help people, as soon as they open it, they would easily just be able to continue. Um, and so these are some of the in like initial sketches I had with Shubik Lubik. Um, I should probably explain what it's about to anyone who's unaware in the panel. It's an urban fantasy. Uh, it takes place in a world where you can buy and sell wishes. So the more expensive a wish is, the more likely it will be to accomplish your desire. So for example, if you buy a wish for a million dollars, it's gonna give you exactly what you want. It's a first class wish, but if you buy a third class wish for like $500 or 500 pounds, it's more likely to trick you. So it's like a monkey's paw. So for example, if you wish to lose weight, your arms and legs would fall off. This is the premise of Shubik Lubik. Um, say next. <laughs> So essentially, 
I was working on it on and off for years. And then I decided during the Cairo Comics Festival, I had been teaching at the time. I was an art teacher um, because I didn't think, I knew I had the story, but I didn't really know where to take it as a comic book. I didn't really know if I could publish it. I didn't know what to do. So what happened was that the Cairo Comics Festival was happening and I was like, I will just self-publish it. I will print a hundred copies and I'll just take it to the Cairo Comics Festival because I really want it to be there. And it's a fun experience. Um, and so I did that. I printed a hundred copies and I took it to Cairo Comics and it was sold out within like a couple of days. And uh, it also won a prize at the festival. So like at that point, I think my life was kind of like balanced between freelancing and working as a teacher and then making comics on the side. And then like after this festival, I was like, oh, I'm just going to make comics. <laughs> so I immediately just like went full time into making comics. Um, and because it won a prize at the Cairo Comics Festival. So this here is the self-published version I printed myself. Um, and then after it won the prize, I was able to get a publisher in Egypt and I was able to get an agent abroad. And because I was able to sell the translation in English, I had an advance that allowed me to work on parts two and three in Arabic. So like for the next few years, I was just maybe for a year, just kind of working on a comic by myself. And then at the end of the year, I would publish it at Cairo Comics. We would print it with the, my Egyptian publishers, the Mahrusa. And then finally, like it would be out in the world. So like the gap between the planning and the drafting and the creation and the time people saw it was so long. It's like maybe over a year really, which is so different from web comics and how I had worked before, but it kind of goes to show that um, external validation can be a very long game. <laughs> like you don't have to get it immediately, but you can do something kind of to your own level of satisfaction before allowing other people to see it. Uh, and for me, this was a more comfortable way to work. Um, and then so the next, the next slide. Um, so this is all three books published. So, so this is the last event we had with the Mahrusa when we published the third part, uh, which was a big deal because usually in Egypt, comics artists tend to burn out before they can finish a long-term project, which is totally fair because there's no support for this kind of project. It's a very self-motivated thing. I was lucky enough because I had this advance and I had publishers abroad who were sort of waiting for all three books to be published in one translation. But at the same time, it involved a lot of self-discipline, more or less, because I had publishers in Egypt and I had publishers abroad, but no one really, like, publishers kind of check in every six months. So if you don't have anything to show in six months, you can just be like, oh, I'll, I'll be back to you in another six months. Like, no one's really going to be on your back asking you for content all the time. So it's, it's something you have to kind of manage yourself if you embark on a challenge, well, I wouldn't say a challenge, but if you choose this career, which is graphic novels. Um, and then the final slide, uh, this is the cover for the American translation, which is just hopefully coming out at the end of the year. Um, and this is very funny to me because this this book is coming out. It's it's all three books of Shabikovic, which, I mean, I could probably show you this is part one, this is part two, this is part three. So it's like, these are all three books and you can kind of tell that it's going to be a really, really big book. Um, but the funniest part is I've been working on this for maybe six years now and it still, it still hasn't come out. Um, so when I think about the process and the drafts and all the things that went into it, I would say the process hasn't just been the drawing. It's also been publishing it in Egypt, interacting with people at Cairo Comics, getting feedback on the graphic novels, getting feedback on the story. It's just things like that. I think people don't really consider when we talk about process, they think mostly about drafts. They think mostly about burnout or inspiration. Um, and for me, I never really had burnout. I just had, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. How can I do this? I, I never, I'm very bad at perceiving time. So even if I don't work for a period of time, I never think of it as a burnout. I just think of it as I'm going to start working next week. <laughs> and weirdly enough, that has worked for me. Um, so that's been sort of my condensed, but also quite long comics journey. Uh, I hope it was clarifying in some ways. 
obviously it's not everything related to making comics. It's, it's much more, you could probably talk about this for weeks, but uh, I hope it was helpful in terms of where I went and how, how it all happened. And I know I didn't really touch on how I work because this was Skina's favorite part of our conversation is me explaining that <laughs> I work in a very strange way, but uh, I feel like it was probably better to explain what I do first so people know in general. Uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you so much for this beautiful presentation. You, you really took us in a journey in, uh, in the <laughs> last uh, few years of your, your work. But, you know, we're opening a um, uh, question. Uh, would you hear, if you'd like, uh, if you have any question, Dina, uh, about, uh, about Dina's work, uh, please feel free. Uh, mine would be, uh, you opened it, Dina, huh? <laughs> Can you talk about your, your work process? Because when we, we shared, it was about um, procrastination and empowering procrastination. And I loved what you said about it. Like usually it's something that is negative, but you could take the positive of it and uh, maybe you can share about it. I mean, essentially what I realized is that our culture, not necessarily our culture, but productivity culture sort of states that you, it's better to kind of work a little bit every day. And it's like for a more balanced lifestyle, you should work a little bit every day. And at the end of the year, you'll have like this great body of work that you've accomplished and you have all of this. But I realized for a lot of people, it just isn't a realistic way of working. It's not for me, for example, I have ADHD. So this was something I realized very late in life. And I realized because of that, it's very difficult for me to structure my time in a way where I can work a few hours on a comic book and then like go play sports and like do, you know, this very idealized lifestyle. I was always under so much pressure with myself to work that way. I was so confused as to why I wasn't able to accomplish this like other people could. <laughs> and it just turns out that some people, for example, for me, it was actually better to spend weeks not working at all, weeks just focusing on having this lifestyle balance. So a few weeks of like doing my errands, a few weeks of kind of managing everything around making comics, almost like being inspired, uh, having full rest, like making sure my software is up to date, buying equipment, setting up your laptop. All of these things are not work, but they are the things you need to do to work. And when I do it, I assumed it wasn't work and I assumed it wasn't effort. So I was always very frustrated as to why I couldn't do this and then also work. And then I realized I actually need to separate these two. I, if I'm working, I can work 10, 12 hours a day and I would be perfectly happy doing this. If I'm in the zone, I'm in the zone. If I'm not, I'm not. And kind of accepting that was a very mm -hmm. long journey because it, for many people, it's not the healthiest way to live, but for others, it is, it is the way to live. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just something you kind of have to work out with yourself. Can you do it? Do you have people you're responsible for? Is it sustainable for you to spend like a couple of weeks working every single day? So these were choices I was making when I was working on the comic books. Um, so I was telling Sukaina, it's kind of like, um, you're kind of coping with your own brain. Like you, it's, it's just like constantly finding coping mechanisms. And not and learning just not to beat myself up about time lost because this was like so much of my life was me thinking ah oh, I should have made better use of that time I could have done like I could have done 10 comics in that time that I spent not doing anything until I realized I can't actually I needed that time not doing anything to spend the time doing things um and so it is part of it is is kind of learning to understand your own work pattern and learning to understand um, how your brain works. <laughs> this is important because you you kind of grow up hearing about a lot of artists who are very eccentric and you're like, oh, yes, I heard this artist worked all night and did this and that. And now I realize it's it's probably how a lot of people work, like more people than you would think, I think. And so it's very difficult to compare yourself to someone who who is able to structure their day, who does work day and night, who wakes up early, gets to start on the day. Um, I think 
the goal is just to to be kinder to yourself mm -hmm. otherwise you'll get nothing done yeah. if you spend time just wasting like if you waste time and then spend the rest of your time regretting the time you wasted then you're wasting more time and mm -hmm. when i realized this i think my productivity increased so much <laughs> which is ironic um but it is something i always tell people when they're very kind of disappointed in how they work like oh I wasn't able to you know produce like 500 pages of a graphic novel I'm like you have no idea how much time I waste you really don't like you think you can't because you have unrealistic expectations for how time works for for how time is structured but if you look at it from the way I worked it's very doable because mm -hmm. I wasted so much time too so it, it took a long time and that's normal so yeah. it's kind of like that I think It's, it's beautiful how you say it. Really, we, we have been shaped <laughs> in our creative process to be productive and not listen to ourselves during those moments where we need to like get inspired, rest our brain, allow our yeah. brain to process more information. What do you think, Lina? Do you have well, to <laughs> I, will, I have a couple of things, a comments. And yes, I, just one question to Dina. First of all, I'm a huge fan of her work. Regardless, of I'm a huge fan of you. <laughs> uh, plus, uh, I think you uh, graphic design has traumatized you, and so <laughs> something because comics artists are a little more up down, uh, maybe. But yeah, it's it's very good that you reach reach such a conclusion at an early age, hopefully in life, and so that you have at peace with yourself and you know how to be realistic. This this really. Is a sign of professionalism. So, welcome to the world. <laughs> uh, I still don't manage my time well at all. So don't don't think it ever works. Uh, I actually but, think more people should just say that because uh, we're all like living under this yeah. illusion of like if you no, see no. someone on Instagram, like with no, their no, breakfast it just gets work and it their, just gets worse. yeah, they Look, they just I, I everyone have... seems so much more organized than you. You're always living this like lie of like, <laughs> is everyone awake? early <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> there is always a no. doubt always no, we're the, comparing yeah. mm. exactly now. and but that's what I'd like to come to other than I have white hair and I'm telling you Dina it just gets worse so don't don't depend <laughs> on it ever getting better but but what I would like to say is I although I admire your your humility I do think you underplay the value of Kahira Uh, very much first as a, a stepping stone to the next stage because you know got you excited uh, you know the reactions of people was something also the interaction if you have not the reaction because there's probably you know good and bad or whatever but and, and yes there's always a, a factor of luck um, which you know Napoleon wouldn't be where he was if he wasn't maybe in the right place at the right height but yeah. but that said he wouldn't have let you know, the Jew, the, these armies, had he not had that quality. So you, 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 you got it. And that's what's important. The storytelling, the interest in skill, working on yourself. And then you were really, yes, at the right time in the right place, but you were also articulating something so, like on everybody's mind, not only in Egypt, but in the entire Arab world, right at the beginning, uh, at the time of the revolution, when, you know, everyone was, uh, emotions were super high and uh, social issues were brought forth into the public because of those, these revolutions. So I do think that it was, you know, a, a collective concern, especially among women, that is also something that you, you visualized it. And that's huge. It's not uh, something that I want you to, you know, just say, okay, I just, you know, got famous because people were interested no i i, I disagree so i i understand i understand i'm often accused of humility when i talk about Bahira. i think i yeah. need to revise how i do this i i yeah, appreciate yeah. it just i think it. yeah I, i i do i do appreciate Bahira now i think it's just it's taken me a long time to get to a place where i can also appreciate what it did for other people um, sure, exactly. just because yeah at, at the time i I think the more I understand it, the easier it is for me to appreciate it. Because at the time, I just felt like it was taking a life of its own. Yeah. And I couldn't control that. And, and that was what made me anxious, is that I, I wasn't able to... Like, I wasn't able to dictate what it was. Because other people mm -hmm. were dictating what it was to me more than I understood, in fact. Which is fair. 
I think that is the nature of art. It's just when you receive mm. so much feedback at once, it becomes very confusing almost because you can't even put like a thesis statement on it. I remember, I, I just remember reading articles about Qahira, like again, from people who had never asked me anything, but they were just talking about it. And I was just yeah, very confused, talking. actually. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was, I was very, very confused as to the assumptions people would make as to how little control I had over it at that point. Mm. But I will say what you're saying is true. And this is something I appreciate now is that Qahira was very important to people, not because it was empowering as like, oh, the thoughts are empowering, the resistance is empowering. I, I said this to Sufina in our interview, but it was, I think it's just that it was the first time people had seen their own thoughts in drawing, which is the inherent power of comics, right? It's just the ability to express something as a comic. And I think it's just because so many people related to it that they liked it. They liked the, th the ideas that were in it more than the superheroism, which is something I took a very long time to articulate myself. It's just to be like, oh, the reason it was popular is because for a lot of Egyptian women, a lot of women, they just haven't seen their own thoughts in writing and drawing. It's just that simple. And so it was just a matter of it being accessible and being relatable, which is the same for comics everywhere, I think. Um, Beautiful, because it comes back to what you were saying in the beginning. As a designer, you're a problem yes. solver. And Qahira was kind of a tool, or the images you made through Qahira was a tool to uh, give the community a voice and like kind of mirror what was going on. And you were saying that you went in the street, you were living this um, uh, scenes of your, uh, your real life and you just translated de façon très innocente, inno with innocence. I mean, these, you know, yes. external <laughs> validation that you talk about weren't there to block the creative process. So, and you put it anonymously. So there was like kind of a detachment from, I guess, the, the, the output of it. And so can yeah, you, I'm it, just, no, no, go ahead, Dina. Sure, no, no, that's, that's all I had to say. No, but no, the, I was just yeah, going to say it's 10 to nine. Yes. It's 10 to nine here. It's 10 to eight there. Yes. Uh, Do you want to take over? Yeah. Yes, please. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> Go for I don't, it. I, I don't want to take over. I'm just wondering that, you know, we we'll probably lose our audience. So uh, I was just... Uh, checking if you wanted me to go forth or do you want to uh, do more questions that's all i think it's fine i think we have closed uh, with dina you can go for it okay okay um i'm uh, going to just quickly present <laughs> i don't know how quickly it's quickly but i guess it'll be the same uh, amount of time as dina's so uh, yes i will introduce myself just a little bit for a couple of reasons uh, so my name is lina reipe uh, I'm a mother, a practicing comics and animation artist, um, and an educator scholar. I teach animation, illustration, comics at the American University of Beirut in the graphic design program. Uh, I'm also a founding director of the, uh, um, the Arab uh, Comics Initiative, uh, which is a center for Arab comics, which has exhibitions, panels, uh, um, of course, um, what are they called? Symposiums uh, and uh, workshops and master classes, as well as uh, the initiative runs the Mahmoud Kahil uh, Pan Arab uh, Award in Comics Illustration and Cartoons. I'm an Arab uh, living in the Arab world and working there. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about my upbringing because I think that greatly influenced um, my work. And so I'm going to talk about it. I was born to a Syrian father and a Danish mother and I have an identical twin. Uh, my bicultural uh, background really helped me look at their world from two different lenses, but it also taught me that these complexities of two different cultures uh, can meet, but also can conflict uh, at the same time. Um, I grew up with many uh, classic children's uh, image books or uh, children's books, um, but also quite a unique uh, number of books from Scandinavia, Russia, Korea. So that was quite enriching. At the same time, my mom uh, collected uh, Arab children, uh, I mean, regional and local uh, children's book first to encourage us to read in Arabic and also to show us the unique uh, 
uh, richness that comes from the region. So we, you know, Dar al-Fat al-Arabi and all those books. So this was a large part of my visual background. Um, uh, I lived in five different Arab cities among others and studied in those schools. So I lived in Cairo, Egypt, Yemen, uh, Sana'a, uh, Damascus, Syria, uh, Kuwait, of course, and Beirut. Uh, and Beirut is where I studied uh, for my BA and um, living and studying in those Arab countries really taught me that being an Arab is not one thing, but a multitude of things. Um, and they're really as different as they are similar. And throughout my work, what I tried to do henceforth was to show this a different aspect of the Arab world than what we usually see in the media of conflict, uh, images of conflict that comes from our region, and to embrace the richness uh, that the region has to offer. Um, so let's start at the very beginning, or maybe not that far back. Okay, so I studied, uh, uh, although I studied uh, fine arts and graphic design in my BA and my master's, I really, the bulk of my work um, and the majority of it is in animation and comics, and so I will be talking more about that, um, and it's all grounded in the Arab world and where I live. I'm only starting with this image because it's one of the earliest uh, things I published. I was also like uh, Dina, 18, uh, and I was at the first year at university and someone asked me to do a cartoon about Lebanon. And it's when I realized I really loved um, telling a story through sequence of images and illustration as opposed to, and I found I was better able to express myself through that, which is graphic narratives today. Um, um, so throughout my career, really, I've been super fortunate to um, explore my personal interests, uh, topics, uh, even if I was part of an institution. And so my work is not usually a response to a brief, as in typical graphic design work uh, and rarely commissioned work. Uh, but I will talk about some of those that and how I made it, you know, interesting for me, even though it was in that context. So it's very contextual and relates to the places I lived in. Uh, upon reflection, if you see here, I, I found like a constant theme in my work. It's uh, really I, things I value very much, which are human rights and social justice, women's rights, uh, refugees, uh, uh, refugee rights, rights of the disappeared during the civil war, uh, victims of the Beirut explosion. And then I'm also um, uh, interested in things that regarding my background, uh, my upbringing, uh, so I explore things such as, uh, with, so it's under our personal identity and uh, belonging and identity and personal narratives, uh, my education in uh, Syria, the Lebanese civil war, and so on. So I'll be talking about some key projects in those areas. Uh, but basically what they're all really in the waqa. So it's much more documentary like than it is a, a pure fiction, although I might fictionalize some things. So, um, of course, I'm in Beirut and inspired by the city always, and uh, everything has the backdrop of Beirut. So I'm going to start with my early years in, in comics for the reason of that uh, I, I joined a collective uh, or a workshop, in fact, that became a collective of uh, six comics artists uh, under uh, Jad Khouri, uh, George Khouri Jad. And um, we made comics and the manifesto of this collective, which was the first uh, collective to do comics uh, for adults in the region as a group. Um, and the manifesto of this group was to make comics first for adults in Arabic, number two, and with the aim to promote comics as an art form. Uh, all the comics stemmed from our life uh, and context and spoke of the status quo, so daily life during war. And uh, I very much believe that the language of pain and suffering is universal. So these stories uh, were produced, showed another side of Lebanon that was not the kind of images that would come uh, in the press and the media and made you hopefully pause uh, to forget the statistics and you know how many people and who fought with who, and then maybe just see the humanity through these stories. Um, here is just the one on the left. You see the... the uh, Pain is visualized through the elif, that is the ah, uh, the ah. Uh, the one on the right is the title of the album Min Beirut, which is uh, all the six artists uh, having several different contributions. Um, I drew Beirut, uh, it's, the stories are also 
about love. Uh, this was a street seller of Jasmine street seller who smokes his cigarette on the corniche and goes out to a pub with his friends and his girlfriend. But I also drew the streets in their grittiness, uh, you know, with the garbage trucks and the Almaza beer and so on. Uh, I drew uh, everything in watercolor, black inks, uh, markers, whatever, you know, could lay our hands on. You have to think this is pre-computer, pre-digital age. Um, we had no Google uh, and no reference images. Everything was drawn from what we saw, uh, what we lived and uh, what we imagined. Um, I soon after that moved into animation. Uh, so from comics, it was a very easy transformation into animation. I was part of a uh, team of uh, the animation department at uh, Pan Arab TV station in Beirut. And um, we did come again animation for adults, which was a pioneering thing at the time. Um, so this was the Rasum al Taharira as a series that was uh, weekly. Every week was one of the uh, animation artists. And the week had five days of comic of animations, and then they were gathered at the weekend. And the, each one was a theme. Each week was a theme. So this this week when I was in charge, the theme was women or women's rights. And I started the week with um, uh, a woman who resembles myself, stemming from my own experience. She's running, trying, you know, to ma have that balance between life, work, and family. Uh, so she constantly just keeps running and running around this this world, keeps turning and turning, and she never, you know, keeps up. And she's carrying the things and stops at the school, at the at the office, at the home, etc. Uh, the second day was um, is uh, the animation is about uh, a conference on Mu'tamar Hukuk al Mar'a and the women's rights. And as you can see, all the panelists are men. And as you zoom out slowly out, all the audience are men. And as you zoom the furthest out, you the only woman is uh, a woman who is watch, watching the TV and she closes it. She has no part of this uh, this whole thing that's going on. Uh, it's something that I witnessed and I've seen and we've seen so many times. Um, also, here the men are protesting, you know, the year 2000 is the year for the Arab woman, and while they're all uh, protesting, we go through the window of the building behind it, and we see that the people who are making the the labor of is are, are the women in the background, again, when they're not actively part of this destiny. So it was, it was more of a commentary. Of course, on the weekend, there is mafiatli, there's no vacation. Um, I was part also of a, a TV channel uh, that was called Zen. it's a youth channel. And I was on the branding identity, but also uh, on the animation aspects of it. And uh, this was part of the branding. And yes, they were amazing at letting us be completely free to explore really quite, uh, um, I would even say some taboo topics, but all, very much about uh, empowerment, women's empowerment, but also diversity and so on. So I started this, this animation starts with a, like a very typical scene, what you expect, what is perceived as the Arab world, you know, the, the pyramids in the desert. And we rotate around a veiled uh, figure, it doesn't have to be a woman, it could be a woman, a man. Uh, but then we zoom through the, the face, which is a screen, um, which is a digital or TV screen. And inside that screen, there's this woman whose arms are, are tied. And she is, um, so it's really about this, the mediatized uh, image of the woman, the woman being constantly followed and commented on. Uh, and so um, the camera turns, all these uh, TV screens are on her and they turn around. And as, um, as we come closer to her, she stops and she returns the gaze she looks us in our eye and she's free flying over the Arab cities, more of the urban area now and uh, in charge of her own destiny. And, and it ends with the TV screen is just a hollow thing that's seeing nothing and the veil is on the floor. Um, ya Waladi was my first uh, independent animation short uh, that went to festivals. This is 2000 and I forgot, six, I think. Anyway, it's um, the. Um, I was very concerned with the, I was very interested and passionate about the issue of the missing. And I would see always the women every Thursday in front of the garden, in, in a garden in Esqua, Beirut, holding the images of the sons, brothers, or husbands who went missing during the civil war, who disappeared. 
uh, and they um, they are holding these the images of their loved ones. These uh, people have been abducted, thrown into prisons, possibly even in other countries. And then it's a very present and real issue, but it's also very politicized. I chose um, in this uh, first to choose animation, which is not an, an, an uh, to talk about the, the mother of one of the missing. Uh, animation is not a typical medium for uh, associated with adult issues, particularly in our region, but it presented such a somber issue. It was difficult to present such a somber issue in a very access, in this way, it could be more accessible and it's, it's people are less afraid to, to, you know, watch it because it seems like, you know, it draws you in on another level than if it was a documentary or very heavy of a topic. Um, so I explored uh, the three things, the visual language, the narrative, and the sound. I mean, I tried to use the animation from these aspects. In the visual aspect, um, I, I wanted a language that contrasted really very much with the reality and the complexity of the subtopic. So I had a woman, I drew the woman very cartoonish, very simple, stark, red hair, and then a background that was much more realistic, uh, much more uh, grainy and textured and with the writings and the, about the, the prisons and so on. And so we follow her daily life. Um, and then in the and then also the fact that she you empathize with a character more when they're simple faces, this is uh, comics uh, theory, uh, but the more particular the face, the more distant you are from it, the more simple the face, in fact, you you become, you can assimilate with this person. Uh, and then in, in terms of the narrative, what I tried to do is unfold the narrative through the, the quotidian, the, the daily uh, ordinary monotony of life, such and domesticity of boiling water, drinking coffee, with no reference at all to the disappeared person or an implication of, of violence. Uh, and this, uh, but the story is very linear narrative so that, you know, we don't lose our audience completely. Uh, and then in the last part, I worked on the sound. I won't show it here, but you can see it on the Vimeo account. The sound was uh, Abdul Halim Hafiz Qari'at al Finjan by, of course, the Syrian poet Nizar Abbani. Uh, and it's fragmented and repeats often, and it mirrors these the characters' repetitive daily motion. So you never hear the entire song. You just hear one word at the very end, which is, Ya waladi. Uh, so um, then um, in, in I'm, I'm sort of going chronologically here because the uh, Arab Spring had sprung <laughs> and the, the uh, war in Syria or the revolution in Syria started, which became, of course, very quickly a bloody and uh, uh, not um, peaceful anymore. Uh, and so this was very heavy on my heart. It's, it's part of, you know, where I come from, family there and it's relatives and friends and so on. But I also found it very difficult to use art and design in the face of death. Are you me and several of my friends who were in the same way felt very vulnerable and very uh, unable to contribute in, in a way that is more meaningful. Uh, so we questioned very much our art. Uh, but one thing that did come together is I, I collaborated with um, two Syrian animation artists uh, and my sister and um, I had an empty abandoned building so I, we took advantage of that. And the reason I'm showing it is that, that we chose to, to stop motion animation and the stop motion animation, um, we used our own bodies. So each one of these are one of us, but we wanted masks first for anonymity, of course, but also to, to give this aspect of uh, stop motion animation and to represent different fractions. So a farmer, a housewife, a, um, a mother, and then a man who, who drowns, that's why his face is blue. Um, and so we were part of the animation, of of the animation physically being in, inside it. Um, we wanted, uh, what we showed was the different ways that, uh, like a, it was called, it's called the wind, uh, and a big wind comes and disperses this, uh, these people over different lands. I was of course concerned with all the racism that they were facing. So some are intense, some are in the mountains in the snow, there's barrel bombs. Uh, some of them are uh, transferred, uh, we're using, uh, trucks that where they're locked in, of course, being killed and dispersed on their own lands and being incarcerated was a big part. So being physically in an animation was uh, quite strange and very, very moving. Uh, and and uh, the whole process was very 
uh, impromptu and unplanned. Okay, um, the last part time is section is about the more personal narratives and issues of identity. Um, I'm starting with uh, uh, what was, I mean, it was also a commission for a platform on uh, uh, comics journalism. And I talked about my education in, in the Ba'ath Syria, the 80s. Uh, I'm starting with this image because there was no reference image. And by this time I have Google, of course, and uh, other sources of, of course, referencing and, and computers uh, and the internet. Uh, but these are like the four images I could find in relation to what kind of an experience I went through and even the logos and things that were used. So um, uh, uh, it, the intention of this audience, it's in English because the intended audience is, is Western or foreign. Uh, and also because I didn't want it to be too exposed to my region due to the fact that I'll never be able to go back probably. But anyway, let's skip that. Um, so it was trying, it's showing the militarized uh, schooling system, the philosophy of oppression and fear in the educational system and physical punishment that was, I feel a big part of some of the reasons or the background backdrop to uh, the, the, the war and the uprising. Uh, I'm not going to go into much of the details, uh, but um, I included uh, in the English version a lot of Arabic text because it's a very important aspect of our region, but also it was part of the slogans that were said, you know, the Ba'athist slogans, and, and the un unanimous uniformity of, of our clothing. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, yes, so I'm continuing to the person. Um, in this one, I uh, it's, it was also for an, an international platform, but this is, I used a, uh, so after the Beirut port explosion, which affected us, it, it was devastating and affected us greatly in, in severely, I must say, for not days or months, but really for the past years. Um, my friend was a graphic designer and uh, um, was living, was working in her studio with her with partners down in Madam Khail when the blast came. And so she, her testimonial was so powerful that I felt that I could process my, what I was going through by telling her story. So I used uh, some of the images that she had given me and she had posted from the explosion and I created uh, Joanne's new, new mantra. And it's it's about this the moment that, you know, they're in the office and the explosion happens and how they, they deal with it and not knowing what happened, going into the streets and seeing the people. I cho chose the two-tone because it, I needed it to have a sort of documentary aspect to it. It has to be clear in telling a very specific narrative. Uh, it's loaded, uh, and but at the end, and if you go through it, you understand, like it's almost, you, you disconnect from that moment when you're in the moment. But the important part to me is the end where, which is some a sentiment on the minds of so many Lebanese. Joanne was saying that a scene, she's, she saw the scene uh, that you only see in nightmares, a scene you want to unsee, death so close to me, death so much of it, leave, 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 leave. Another mantra started and it hasn't stopped since. So this, the aspect of, of um, um, people wanting to leave, to emigrate, which is such a, a heavy thing on all our hearts and it's happening and we're losing so many people. So I, I felt this also told a lot about how these kind of things, uh, this context affects us greatly. The very last thing uh, in the personal narratives and issues of identity, and this is also part of living vulnerably, is I have an identical twin. This is when we had red hair, uh, both of us, now it's only me. Um, uh, it was work for a uh, art and literary journal that is, uh, the theme was on health and uh, illness. And I felt that I, there was an interesting perspective of being a twin where we both share our illnesses. Sometimes they happen at the same time and sometimes I'm affected by something. So in order to know if, if I'm ill, I just ask her, are you feeling this? And she says, yeah, I am. So I know, okay, it's fine. And if not, then I know that something's wrong. So, but then I, we realized that uh, nobody else does this. 
we thought that everybody does this. So this is talking, this is more far more introspective. You can see the, the style and the approach that I've worked on was much more, a little more fluid, a little more less visceral, less, uh, you know, it's direct narrative, um, but it, it also tells of how we process this this relationship of, of being two, but at the same time uh, intersecting and being intertwined, that we, we use each other's almost body to understand if our own. Uh, I mean, even to the extent that I wear, if I wear, need to buy some glasses and I, I go to a shop, I take her with me and then she wears them and I see how I look. So it's, but Turns out, of course, nobody else does that. And it ends with a piece that is uh, uh, that we started talking about a dream that was very, uh, I was talking about a dream that's very reoccurring, and she finished it for me. So uh, she was having the same dream. <laughs> and so we, um, I needed this page to be much more dreamlike, a bit confusing, the, the issues that people question, um, the, the what was in the dream, of course, but also art that I was at the time interested in the Kiriko and his work and I want I felt that very much represented so it's a, refer, a lot of referencing that I am putting here so I will end with that thank you very much and I hope I didn't take too long I think it's fine thank you so much first of all I'd like to thank uh, Sukaina for being incredibly um, Sukaina I'll share yes stop sharing uh, patient with me and uh, so understanding. But I would really like to thank uh, Huda, Sukaina, Bahia, and Yasmin for this uh, really important work that you're putting together that I hope continues uh, with many more um, designers, artists joining and panels we look forward to. It has been a joy to, to be watching all the other panels and I look forward to the next one. Thank you, thank you so much. Nina, you. you you have taken us in a journey, and mm -hmm. the title of your uh, presentation says it: uh, vulnerab vulnerability, vulnerability. Um, it's it's very daring to be able to face uh, uh, our emotions, and it's another step to be able to translate it into into drawing and share it. It's um, it's showing a lot of strength and being able to open yourself uh, through all this process, especially with powerful images of war, powerful images of blood, powerful images of emotion. Um, I don't know, Dina, if you have any question, but I have a lot. <laughs> and we still have maybe 15 minutes. So I want to announce to the audience that they are, um, they are open to ask any question to Dina, Dina, Buddha, or me. And we're going to continue discussing these 15 minutes. So we're going to wait for your questions. Dina, do you I have, do have anything some questions. to say? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have so many, actually. Um, but regarding, I think, living vulnerably, especially, uh, would you say that it was easier or more difficult later in your career? Like, as you made more and more personal content, do you think it was something that increased or actually dis decreased where you were you sort of like, did you become more cynical? I'm always interested in, in the cynicism that happens. <laughs> um, so I, I would love to know your, your journey through this, especially. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think you become more cynical in life for sure <laughs> uh, because of probably all what you experience. But I do think I have the advantage over your generation, Dina, of not being able to get any reaction from anybody beyond your little family. So I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, or, or your close people. So I didn't ever have this impending, you know, doom of expectations. I just draw because I can't live without it. And I don't know any other way, honestly. Um, I don't, the, the one place I don't question myself in the, not the sense of that, oh, I'm great at all. And in the sense that it just flows. Of course, then I keep trying and it's, is it too, you know, as you build on the artwork, then you then you start to question. But the, the beginning, it just, it's always a moment, you know, like I was crossing the bridge and I saw the mothers of the missing and I just had to, I knew I had to do an animation about it. And, and I didn't even draw a storyboard. I literally started and then I said, okay, stop. And I went back and I do the, worked on the storyboard. And even that, it's mm -hmm. very 
fluid. So uh, you do question yourself. The one thing I would say, Dina, is that I think teaching uh, has made me force myself to not make it a pure, or at least not force myself, but to consider not to make it pure, just whatever comes, comes. So I'm now trying to be a little more, push myself to be, why don't I try some, you know, different, do I do uh, um, even a visual concept? I'm, I'm trying, trying to explore more of that aspect, which in the past, I really just, whatever first comes to mind. And then of course I keep working on it and keep developing it and keep, but you, there's that moment, you know, it's done and that's it. And you just mm. put it out there. But I don't, I really don't think a lot about how people are going to take it because it's, I have to do it. So then mm. it comes, it comes. And if they, the, mm. the other, the one thing I would say is that the things that are a little more politicized, I have to, yes, I have had to make considerations. I have turned down two animations that were super big with a channel in, in, in London because it was too uh, dangerous mm. being a Syrian to yeah. do that animation. Uh, although I very much believed in what they said or the, mm. their idea, it, it was a documentary, it was a pure documentary, but it was uh, too, the implications were too big. So I did feel that the things like the education, it, it's, I don't feel I'm very much criticizing as much as this is how it was. This is the kind of education I had and mm -hmm. deal with it. <laughs> so, okay. But yeah. Um, I think we have another question. We have two questions. Huda, do you want to take the... Yeah, I, I want to continue because the whole time, I mean, it's a question for both uh, Dina and, and Lina. You know, the work when you... I mean, we all know that working in the Middle East, you have to be very uh, careful with what you say because you know there's like over over uh, there are serious consequences uh, yeah. most of the time. And I was, yes, I mean to say it politely, you know, some <laughs> some places worse than others, but you know, there's like no place that's safe actually. Um, so it depends what you're talking about. And of course, the you know, one day you can say something and the next day it's a bad idea because the politics have already shifted. So, you know, the work that you are doing is really courageous, both of you, and, and really beautiful, courageous. Even just talking about social issues, about women's issues is already politically charged. Mm -hmm. So I, my question to you is... Um, you know, you, you know, you're getting into this with knowing that there are risks behind it. But does that influence also, like Lina, you said it a little bit in a way you addressed it. How does it influence the way you create your narrative or the way you show the images or the way you deal with it so that it is um, not immediately in your face, but still it's understandable what the message is? Yeah. Well, what, what are I can... your strategies in a way? Well, what I can really say is that there, there are two things. There's one, and like Dina said, under, comics is underground and nobody reads it. So you're not in much trouble because <laughs> just we're under the radar. So that's one part. Um, really, it's true. No matter how much we think, oh, wow, it's so cool. Everybody's reading it. No, there are like 100 people reading it and that's it. But another thing, but the animations were very widely seen because it was particularly at the time in the Arab world when there were only two, three Arab stations, so it was much more visible if, if so. But even then, uh, I, the way I see it, first, this is anyway uh, something I truly believe in. I always try to take the humanitarian or the hum humane aspect. So it's about human rights, primarily to me, how people are treated with respect and uh, dignity. Uh, and then everything else, you know, I don't care who fights who and why. I really, what my issues are that, you know, women have equal rights, the children can go to school, uh, public schools are available, refugees are treated with respect, they're, you know, kicked out of their countries and no racism. So to me, these issues, however anybody wants to pull it into a very politicized direction or, you know, leaning towards different fractions, I always try to pull it back to being something that is just about the humanity. The thing also, Huda, which is, and thank you really much for this question, is that I'm half, half, half. And this really has affected me because I always feel I'm an intruder. So I'm, I, I, 
particularly don't feel I would have a say or if I do take a political stance very much as I, I almost feel like <laughs> I don't have that right because uh, being having a foreign mother, we have always been looked on as the outsiders. And honestly, it's the same in Denmark. I mean, it's not like I fit in there at all. You know, I'm the exotic Arab there. So, <laughs> so uh, this did play a big role in me making sure I just took that. Uh, and I don't think it's so, very much just to be safe uh, as a safe perspective as much as I truly, truly believe in that. So it's it's one of my values. I, I don't know about Dina. It would be interesting to hear her. Um, for me, honestly, I, I don't consider myself as someone who addresses anything really like I, <laughs> um, how, how do I put this? I make now, now my comics are pure fantasy. Well, um, wait, Dina, you were, you were I, anonymous. Why were yes, you? Yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, the call with the thing is actually, <laughs> I was mainly anonymous because it was on Tumblr and it's like, uh, at the time, I it just like Tumblr, it's not really a platform where you share your personal information. So it was more also just a normal sense of online security. Like, why would I tell people who I am? And, you know, I'm, this is the platform where I come to talk about TV shows and mm. this and that. And then eventually, because of the friends I had there who were all also like in diaspora, Arabs of different backgrounds, um, people who had so many different experiences. And then because of the things we were going through at the time. So this is 2013. Um, I always, whenever I talk about this, I always say this was a time when I had a lot of opinions and now I don't have opinions anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you will, you will, don't worry. <laughs> if I have any opinions, I keep them to myself. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say please. yes yeah please go for it we have a question for no you. no that's that's all um, yes we have a question from Ranim Baden um we, we still uh alors, thank you Dina for such an inspi inspiring talk you mentioned you. working anonymously for the first two years can you share more from your experience as a woman artist in the Middle East what are the pros and cons and what have been the main challenges, if any, you faced since you went public? Um, we still have a few uh, minutes, so if you can answer shortly, I think you already answered part of the question. I would say, um, the thing about comics is that it's such a small field. It's, I don't think it could even be considered a field, right? Like it's actually one of the most welcoming, one of the most pleasant Unity. spaces oh. to work because it's so you don't rely on anyone with other jobs the problem with being a woman in any job is being a woman <laughs> so it's the interaction with the community at large like the challenges of being a female comics artist are unrelated to comics they're just related to being a woman which is like going you know it's it's public transport it's being in a community it's this and that but with comics you're so independent there everything is so um small and personal that you don't really face the larger structural problems you would have of like working in a company like my worst experience as a woman was when I was working at a startup in an and like as an animation or for this and that like when I had to work with other people that's when I remembered I'm a woman because normally I don't like remember it when I'm working in comics I'm just like yeah I'm making my comics blah 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 so again I think this is a matter of just being I don't think it's something that's related to comics I would say women comics artists in big comics industry like in France in Japan in America it's probably tougher to be a woman in comics there than it is in the Arab world because we don't really have an industry it's so small it's so welcoming and the reason I came out uh, with Kohera is that just eventually it stopped mattering it stopped feeling um, it, it, it eventually died down and I was so excited to talk to other comics artists in Egypt that I would say oh by the way I did this comic and they were so excited because they had been seeing it and they didn't know who did it and they were very welcoming so it was actually a pleasant experience it wasn't it wasn't for me for me this is to me comics is kind of a space a safe space almost <laughs> as opposed to like working in any other field in Egypt. So. Very true, very true. Mm -hmm. But we're also mm -hmm. lucky because, like you said, it's a small community. Yes, it's and absolutely. In, 
in in the animation department, I was the only woman and one of the earliest, you know, women animators. Mm -hmm. And but and this is why I was given by the TV every year. Okay, you're doing the, uh, you know, Yom Al Mar'a because mm -hmm. there was nobody else in the whole mm -hmm. TV. And of course, I I was I wasn't even asked to do it, but uh, once or twice I was asked. Um, and but in, in general, I just done anyway. And I was the only one who cared and even you know planned for it. <laughs> but that it was like you said, it was such a welcoming place because they're all my friends, and and it wasn't an issue of women or not. I want to ask you a, a, a last question be, be, before closing. It's about designing for social impact. I would love you to answer very shortly. But I'm wondering when you are working on your uh, images, on your uh, drafts, um, and you have expectations, of course, of a certain impact because you, you draw it for within an intention. Um, how do you value this impact? Um, you, you, inspire, you, you get inspired for the environment, you get inspired for your proper experience, of course, but there is a certain moment where you want to scale and you want to scale in depth uh, as talking to a community, but reaching deeply one person. So uh, how each one of you does this um, according to her creative process? Start, Dina. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, so for me, my the impact I wanted to make is that I wanted to have, I wanted in Egypt for there to be graphic novels, which is, it's such a simple thing to say. But uh, it's because it gave me so much joy to read a full, like, long comic, and it's so it's such it was such an easy, simple goal to focus on. I wanted to have a book that was in bookstores that people could buy and read, <laughs> and it and really when and you would think that this is obviously the goal, but actually, in order to do that, I was thinking design. I had to think of how I would be able, first of all, in order for a book to be in bookstores, for example, it had to be black and white because if it's in color, it's too expensive to print. People won't afford to buy it. Uh, in order for people to read it, it has to be read in a certain way. It has to be simple. It has to be compelling to this, for this and that. So for me, my goal was just to be part of Egypt's comics culture. I wanted to be a part of, I, I sincerely believe that comics in Egypt and in the Arab world, someday will be huge. And if not huge, I think they, they are important. I think it's important for someone eventually to grow up and, and read comics because I was missing this when I was younger. My generation before me, my parents grew up reading comics, but I didn't. We had very few comics by the time I was growing up. And so I just wanted to contribute to this I wanted to you know having made web comics I realized oh there is capacity for people people are open to this they're excited about it they want to read more they want to see themselves in drawing they want to feel invested in a story so I just wanted to make the best work I could possibly do which is so simple but actually in the Arab world and if you're working alone and if you don't have a lot of mm -hmm. support and if you don't have a lot of guidance you have to really search the guidance yourself there is guidance, but you have to look for it and you have to be constantly asking after people. And so to me, that was the kind of impact. That was the kind of impact I wanted. I wanted mm -hmm. to just do the best I possibly could. Yeah. Um, it's like, in Arabic, we call it almost like it, it's just working to the best of your ability. It, to, because mm -hmm. when other people, like for me, I'm very inspired when I see good quality work. Because no one is asking for it. No one is going to look after you and tell you, oh, is this good or not? No one is going to scale your work by quality. So you have to be the person who says, oh, I want to make this as good as possible mm -hmm. for the audience. I want to make it as good as possible for me. So mm -hmm. that yeah, it, it's kind of a, a self-motivation. So that was yeah. kind of what I was looking for. Almost. It was yes, a good driving force. Yeah. Very good, very, very true, Dina. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, so, okay, now I would say, uh, first of all, definitely the with the Jad Workshop Collective, which was back in the 80s, late 80s, that was our, our goal was make comics for adults and uh, make it hopefully, hoping one day there would be enough readership and a movement. And here it is. So, I wouldn't ever have guessed that, you know, it was someday a seed somewhere. 
um, but but just to give you an example of that, so I don't I don't ever work with the goal of an impact, but sometimes I'm I find out about the impact later and I'm really floored. So uh, yeah, like Lina's I, Lina's work had impact on me. So I just want to. That's beautiful. Definitely. I, couldn't, I would never have guessed that. See, that's really important because um, a, a young man came to to the TV where we were working, and he interviewed uh, Jad and I, and or was talking to us, and we got into a long discussion and we said you know and Jad was saying you know the, the Jad workshop and the failed attempt and you know it didn't work out as comics and he was like oh how could you say that I grew up on this and it was the it was the reason I became a comics artist and you know oh. my whole life changed because of that Majdi wrote to Jad before he ever knew him like asking him for his work because it wasn't mm -hmm. available you know things a little less internet yeah. of the time uh, and we're floored that People even knew about our work or watched mm -hmm. it. Regarding the TV, that was an interesting thing. So uh, again, we were invited, but uh, Ajad went to Tunis for a big, wait, was it Morocco? I forgot. Uh, I'll remember now, just a second. Um, for a, a big award, award in, I think, short mm -hmm. films and everything. And mm -hmm. one of the awards was, was given to the, the animations from the future TV where I worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ajad's was, was a contender. The thing was that there were very few Pan-Arab uh, TV stations at the time that everybody in the Arab world looked at and it had value then. Uh, but when he went there to receive the award on, on his behalf and others, they we had he had a standing ovation for 10 full minutes. Mm -hmm. And he didn't we didn't like we didn't get it. We had, you know, beyond just doing our little animation, we thought nobody watched us. <laughs> nobody had an idea what we did, <laughs> you know, except the the especially the ones that came after the news. Those are the ones everybody saw, but all the others in between. But we have heard throughout the years how they impacted and how it made a difference on on, you know, their being interested in, let's say, design or visual or motion graphics or animation on that so at some stage there is there is an impact and uh but i don't think it's ever a goal mm -hmm. but i'm very happy if, if there is any kind and very very humbled of course by any interest mm -hmm. you're fully said uh, whenever there is intention it flows yeah. right yeah. thank you thank you so much i am humbled by this panel and i i'm really happy to have had the privilege of diving in your wisdom and your journey and your life journey thank you so much thank you nina thank, thank you, you. Nina. thank you Sarah. we are missing you yeah. hopefully we <laughs> yes. very nice. Hi, hey, uh, this is what I was thinking. Hey, uh, thank you so much thank yes. you for all this well, I would you. love to take the opportunity to um, remind you that the next panel is on women designers in diaspora, navigating multiple identity and practices. Well, this will be uh, held by Huda, who is with us, <laughs> on Thursday, 12th of May. So it's from 7 to 8.30. Don't miss the webinar and register. Before... Um, yeah, I'm just going to uh, thank first before... <laughs> Yes, um, the exhibition uh, is still on. Uh, it is still running until the 19th of May. So uh, you can join the exhibition whenever you like from 1 to 7 on Thursdays. Uh, a, a kind reminder, we have shared all the collaborative work and the um, contributions of uh, uh, different designers in here in the A to Z Presents, uh, who is uh, run by Anya, who is hosting us. Uh, with Bahia, who initiated uh, this exhibition. Um, you can also contribute to our research if you have anything to say, anything to share, um, papers, publications, your work, uh, please send a mail and uh, come back by if you are in Berlin, you are more than welcome. Um, thank you, Hout Foundation Center of Arab to typography, Arab Fund for Arab Arts and Culture and ACC, ACSS. <laughs> I'm losing my voice here. <clears throat> and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, A to Z. I have to say that. I have to thank them all because, because of them, we are able to do these panels and also to share our publication. Thank you, audience, for being here and uh, bearing with us and sharing with us and see you very, very soon. 
Thank you, Huda. <laughs> Thank you.